namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan sao yu. 我今见闻得受持，愿皆如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. 师父上人，各位师兄，大家，阿弥陀佛。Welcome to our sutra lecture today. My name is Hong Shi. Today is Sunday, July tenth. My goodness, ten days into July here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia, and other places in Asia. It is Saturday, July ninth in California, and we are about to explain another piece of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hua Yin Jing. So, to get into our Proper Dharma listening mode. We're going to first invite the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, the assembly of the flower garland, uh, and the Dharma protecting spirits, the Tian Long Babu, the gods, the dragons, the Eightfold Pantheon, to to draw near and to bless everyone listening to this text, to the sutra. So, let's uh, make that request now. Protocol is to acknowledge country, and we do that. We say that the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practiced spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to creation here in this location for tens of thousands of years. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share the land today, with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, mostly after the white people landed on these shores. And with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together, we acknowledge their wisdom, their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all First Nations peoples whose sovereignty was never ceded. All right, I feel a little closer to being an actual Aussie person when I when we acknowledge country. So, all right, how's everyone doing tonight and this afternoon? It is a brisk. 
cold and windy winter day here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. And you know it's winter when walking up the uh, tarmac driveway, you see the birds lying flat on the tarmac, on the blacktop with the sun beating down. <laughs> this is their way of taking advantage of the sunlight to warm up and to uh, chase the bugs out of their feathers. It's remarkable that we ran into a tawny frogmouth bird, a large bird, looks like an owl, isn't an owl, uh, lying with his wings spread out on the, on the blacktop yesterday. And the magpies do it and the currawongs do it. And you realize that uh, we really do uh, share this uh, entire system with, with uh, share the biosphere with all these different creatures. And as long as you have a body, uh, you're part of this uh, larger makeup. And when you see the birds behaving just the way people do, trying to get warm, my cold mornings, I go out in the sun and warm up. You think, who's, who's in that body with feathers? Who's in this body with skin? Hmm, interesting, interesting question. We're going to be looking into that question later on today. I'll give you a preview of today's attractions. We're going to look into the, um, the, the songs of praise sung by a bodhisattva whose name is Gundalin, Forest of Merit and Virtue. Um, we're going to be translating and chanting those, those verses in both Chinese and English. We're also going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to continue our teaching on the, the names of the seven Tathagatas, Qi Rulai, Ming Hao, and, and the benefits that come when we learn to chant. Still a work in, in progress. I haven't quite got the, the, the introduction that I'm looking for. So to make it a more singable uh, set of, of, of tunes, but it's, it's certainly, uh, I'm interested, and this, this caught me by surprise. I just stumbled across the Qi Ru Rai Shang Hao as a Dharma, as a method, the, the seven Tathagata's names, and uh, started introducing it to all of you just uh, two, three weeks ago now, and uh, it's really come alive as something that, uh, that's a good thing to do, especially, especially if you're surrounded by um, animals, fish, birds, ghosts, there's reference to ghosts, and, and it's a really compassionate way to uh, do, among other things, interestingly, we're gonna talk about this, it's if you wanna be beautiful, do you ever look in the mirror and think, maybe heaven hates me, gave me this face or this hair or this fashion sense or something's wrong with my appearance, right? If so, we have a method for you. We'll be talking about that later. Then we're gonna conclude with some storytelling. And storytelling, I wanna, I, I was, Again, this just kind of popped up in my consciousness, um, aware that as I'm talking to my computer today here in the Buddha Hall, we have, we have a, this is the largest crowd we've had in a couple of years listening to a sutra lecture. Terrific, glad so many folks are here. Um, but uh, often I'm talking just to a computer knowing that out, out there there's a hundred folks listening. And because you, uh, you still see the knowledge, oh, okay, oh my goodness, all right. I'm gonna unshare, there we are. Yeah, yeah, there we are, I'm talking to you, thank you. Uh, we're working out this screen sharing business. So uh, realize that, that when I can't see the people I'm talking to because of the, it's a internet lecture, there are likely uh, lots of folks from different phases of their involvement with Buddhism. And many people are kind of testing it out. Maybe check out this Buddhist stuff. And I started jotting down the reasons why people become more engaged, more involved in being a Buddhist. And I came up with 21 reasons, which I want to share with everybody. Uh, and I hope that you will contribute some, some more. Uh, 
give feedback in the comments and if you want to add a comment in the uh, YouTube if you're listening or if you want to, to correspond with the, the translators on the Chinese channel, uh, let me know. You'll, you'll see what I mean when we get into it. All right, so that's coming up. Those are our previews. We're going to do the seven Tathagata's names. We're going to chant the praises by the Bodhisattva Forest of Merit and Virtue. And we're going to look into reasons why, reasons why one becomes a Buddhist. And I've also got a special bonus video of the old monk who knows how to, the, the Lao He Shang, who knows how to uh, uh, recite the Buddha's name. Okay, that's, a, that's the cherry on the top of the dessert sundae. Okay, here we go. Bring up my preview. And now I know I have to, uh, have to share this screen. So let me do that first. Here we are. Here's today's first verse. Right there, and I put my palms together and chant it. You're welcome to join me if you care to. Here we go. Bi Ju Ru Lai Dang Ming Hao Shi Yi Tong Guo Du Jie Feng Le Shen Li Shi Zi Zai the Tathagatas we each serve all share the same names. Their Buddha lands are full of wealth and joy, sovereign self-mastery and spiritual strength. Gundalin Pusaf, Bodhisattva, is in the palace of the Suyama heaven. This is the third level of, of six heavens in the desire realm. Uh, it's really there, according to the Buddha. If you had your eyes open, you could see it. If I had my eyes open, I could see it. It's really there. And the Buddha is about to speak Dharma. And part of the things that happen, the Buddha sends out light, informing everybody that the Dharma lecture is starting. And bodhisattvas come streaming in from all directions. They arrive. They bow, they take a, a seat, they sit on the seat in full lotus and wait their turn. Then one by one by one, they leave their seat, come down, maybe walk around the Buddha possibly, just like our Dharma requesters did just now. And they kneel down, put their palms together and do some spoken word poetry. They chant their praises, they share their hearts, they really uh, talk about things that, are, that impress them. And these, um, yes it is a sutra, yes it is a classical text, yes it is a scripture, but it's also a very living document. I, it doesn't take much to get into the spirit of these praises and realize, here's a bodhisattva singing his heart. He's in front of the Buddha, he's the, the leader of the group, and he wants us to know how he feels about that. So, he says, the Buddhas that we all serve all have the same name. All bodhisattvas in worlds in all directions. The Buddha lands that these Buddhas teach in are full of wealth and joy. Full of sovereign self-mastery called shen li zi zai and spiritual strength. Okay, brief, terse, but he's excited about it. Um, Buddha lands is, the creation of Buddha lands, making a world is one of the really, um, you'd say far out aspects of, of the Dharma. Um, Creation stories, how does, in the, the Hebrew scriptures, you know, it took seven days for God to make the world. Every time a Buddha in, in on what's called the, the ground of causation, when he's there cultivating, he or she is transferring whatever body they're in, they're transferring merit 
to the creation of a world. And here it is. Buddha lands full of wealth and joy. Mm. So, if you were to make it real for you, what did you do today? Did you bow to the Buddha today? Did you recite the Buddha's name? Did you recite a mantra? Did you refuse to kill in order to feed your body? Did you eat clean food that didn't involve the death of something else in order to nourish you? All of those aspects of practice can be transferred to a future Buddha land. That's where they're made. They're made in your thoughts as you share the benefits of your next good deed, right? So it's a very living, it's an ongoing process. Buddha lands in the making. We look at the the Hebrew scriptures and you think, oh, that was, you know, how long ago did did the tablets come down from Mount Sinai? Was it 2,000 years ago? Was it 2022? Is that the birth of Jesus? You know, what was the, when was this happen? The creation of lands where these Buddhas teach full of wealth and joy, sovereign self-mastery and strength, spiritual strength, happening right this minute. It's an ongoing process if you pick it up, if you decide to do it. All right. Next. Shifang yi che chu Che wei fo zai ci Huo jian zai ren jian Everywhere, in each direction, we claim the Buddha is here with us, or we see him among people, see him resting in the Deva's palace. The, these verses repeat the prose that happened earlier, and we heard about this phenomenon. Uh, where everybody feels the Buddha's looking right at them. <laughs> Every one of these uh, palaces, the, the feature that we heard about when the Deva was preparing was this remarkable phenomenon that no matter how many worlds the Buddhas appear in, everybody in that world thinks, oh, we got the Buddha. The Buddha's here with us. And yet in another world, same feeling. Is that possible? Yeah, if you have the sovereign self-mastery and spiritual strength that the Shan Li Tzai, that the Buddha has. And it's a phenomenon of what? This is, a, this is, they say, a program in your self-nature, in my self-nature, already coded in there, that when you realize Buddhahood, when you take away the things that cover your nature, this circuitry, this code, think of it like a computer, is all there waiting to be booted up in the dharma body, the fa shen, the reward body, the pao shen, and the, the division bodies, the hua shen. That incredible science-defying but amazing, totally true capability is all there inside, waiting to be booted up. And we've, we've used this uh, analogy before, but do you, what, what kind of software do you have on your computer? Um, can you, do you have any single program that you're really good at? For example, maybe somebody learned the secrets of Adobe Acrobat. You pretty much, everybody who deals with a PDF uh, format has to figure out how to open it. So you get Adobe, you get Acrobat Reader, but Acrobat, for example, just to name one, is, has all these amazing abilities that you can edit PDFs, you can OCR, you can change the color and the font and the, the size, and you can sign documents inside of, you know. How many people know how to operate all those functions? Well, maybe that's yours. Maybe, maybe you're really good at Apple's keynote, and you can do fancy slideshows and have the transitions and have things bounce and fall on the page and dissolve, right? All that ability is there, but only some people know how to make it work because they've taken the time or taken a course, an online course, 
or they went through school and learned how to do it. All those abilities are there, but we don't necessarily take the effort or the time to learn how to use them. We just use the same old set of stuff that we've always used. Our Buddha nature is the same. And now in, you know, in the computer age, we have this analogy to, to, to make us understand what it might be like, right? The nature has in it all these incredible functions. Uh, psychic powers hmm, is one, okay? Another one, dharani, the ability of, incredible ability of speech. Wow, if we had the tian er tong, for example, among the six psychic powers, we could hear the sounds spoken in other worlds, in the heavens. We could hear the cries in the hells, not recommended, but it's there. We can hear the voices of insects and birds and we can certainly listen in on our neighbor's conversations, not that you'd want to do that. So all that ability is there waiting to be clicked on and powered up, booted up. So that's a part of having the three bodies, latent, inherent, waiting inside of us to be, to be activated, is that you can appear in different places at the same time. You know the old bumper sticker? How can you be many places at once when you're not anywhere at all, right? Yeah, well, the Buddha has the answer to that question. He can be in many places at once. Um, he is truly zizai, his self is present there. People would talk about Master Hua having that experience. Sitting in on Shurfu's Dharma talk, they would feel like he was talking directly to them, not only looking at them, but the teaching was unlocking something inside them. And if he was saying, you know, you have to learn to stop getting, you have to learn how to give purely everything you offer to the Buddha, you hope that you're gonna get blessings back. That's just greed. And everybody goes, well, mm, yeah, I did that yesterday. I did that today, you know. Giving with a little hook to get something back, you know. He would, he would talk about, you know, the things that, that pollute our human nature and everybody would immediately say, Oh, how does Shurfu knew I know I did that? I did that. And then, geez, he's looking right at me. You know, they had that feeling that that was a common thing that people would talk about. And uh, so when you have taken this, deconstructed the self that we all operate from, the big me in the middle, every bit of self that we can remove, that's one bit of the Buddha nature's functions that we can manifest. Um, good way to start, if we had to name one way to move into that project, is to listen more. Face to face with a family member, what if, what if, when your sister was talking about something that you ordinarily just block out, because it's just so rattly tattly, lolo so so and meaningless, if you listen to her, and didn't have a comment ready when she was done. Just listen to listen. You didn't listen so that she could come back with No, you just listened. And you, hmm, tell me more about that. And encourage her. Your relationship with your sister would be so different. She'd be shocked that somebody was finally listening to her. And uh, that's one example. Letting the self wait while you serve others. So there's lots and lots and lots of ways to, to start in that process of reducing the, that covering over the functions that the sutra tells us are right there waiting. Right? How did the Buddha get to be a Buddha? Well, he did that work completely. He removed the self, and now he can create Buddha lands so that everywhere in each direction we feel, it says here in the Chinese, jie wei fu zai zi. Everybody feels and says, the Buddha is right here in our world with us. In fact, he's in multiple worlds at once with everyone feeling that same phenomenon. Or we see him 
somewhere among people, or we see him sitting in the Deva's palace, but in all directions, people feel that the Buddha is there with them. Isn't that interesting? Do you, how, what do you do when you hear this from the sutra? Do you go, oh, baloney, nonsense? Or do you go, how is that possible? Could that, somehow that, there's a little echo in the back that says, how does he do that? I kind of, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Totally prepared in the nature for us to go activate it. But we have to believe it and then take the first step and the second and the third step. Small, simple baby steps gets us there. Here we go. Rulai pu anju yi che zhu guo du wo deng jin jian fu chu ci tian gong dian The Tathagatas all abide at peace amid, amid all the various countries we all see these Buddhas at rest in the Deva's palaces. The Tathagatas, the Buddhas, that's their name, that's a title, Rulai. Tathagata, the, the second A gets the long Tathagata. All Anju, they're all sitting there peacefully, they're all at rest amid the various countries, wherever they appear. And we, says Forrest Merton Virtue, get to see the Buddhas because we're here in the Deva's palaces with him in all these different worlds. Um, is there a technical name for this, bilocated or co-located? Is that what you call it, where you're in one place and at many places at the same time? Zoom lets us do that, isn't it? Uh, everybody listening today to our Chinese, Chinese translation, uh, usually there's 70, 80 folks, they're, they're listening on Zoom and they're in different places. Some are in Neimenggu, uh, some are in, you know, uh, Dongbei, Harbin, some are in Zhejiang, some are in uh, uh, Wenzhou, Quanzhou, Suzhou, Hangzhou, all seeing, you know, my face and hearing my voice co-locate. Technology gives us this, the first chance to actually kind of replicate what the Buddha is doing with the, the inner technology, the inner net that he has now activated and alive. So amid all those various countries, we see the Buddhas at rest in the Deva's palaces. What would it be like? I'm going to share my, on the share here. Can you imagine, uh, I want to show everybody something Quite wonderful here. Move that aside, please. Oh, there we go. All right, I found something that I very much enjoy and appreciate, and I want to share it with everybody. The uh, National Gallery of Asian Art at the Smithsonian in Washington has an online presence and an exhibit right now in medieval Japanese Zen art. And even though it's Japanese, um, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the pieces in the exhibit came from Japan, they're all based on Chinese Buddhism. So for the, for the most part, it's Sino-Japanese art. What do we have here? We're talking about how the Buddha appears in front of us. Um, this is not a Buddha. These are Buddhist monks. And I'm going to, it's now at 11%. I downloaded this. Here we go. 100%. I downloaded this from the online website of the Freer, F-R-E-E-R, -E -E Freer Gallery the National Museum of Asian Art, the Freer Collection. Um, and I was very much taken by this image of a mountain monk. This is a Shan Sung, Ku Xing Sung. 
You can see he's got no, f no flesh on his bones. He hasn't seen a razor for three years. Uh, and his, he's wearing pretty much rags. They're nice looking rags, but they're, he's been wearing this one set of robes forever. His shoes are all ratty. And he has come down. He's got his hands not palms together. Who is he talking to? He's talking to this monk. And this monk is well shaven. He's well dressed. He's got fancy palace robes on, nice shoes. He looks well fed. Uh, and notice he's very respectful. He's got his palms together and he is asking Dharma of the mountain ascetic. I'm totally uh, interpolating into this. This is uh, Yun Men Wen Yen Fa Shi uh, asking uh, Dharma from a monk whose name is, I need to, here we go, hold on here, of, who is it? Fa Yen Wen Yi Fa Shi from, so it's two schools, two Dharma schools, patriarchs talking to each other. One is currently well-fed and is living indoors in the palace. The other one is living out in the mountains and he is requesting Dharma of him. But what I like about this is notice the expression, notice the eyes, the, the painter. This is from the Muromachi period, about 1500. Uh, the painter has captured the light in the eyes of this monk. He's got something special going on. Uh, his eyes are very bright. He is a Mingyan Shan Zhishi. And the eyes of this monk, notice his expression. He's very humble, very respectful. He's looking up at the taller monk physically, but more the he's taller in virtue as well. He's out there doing the hard work of ascetic, ascetic practice. But these are Dharma friends. These are going to become Chiryinja, uh, bosom uh, colleagues, Tong Chan Dao Yo. And this encounter of two monks on the road gives us an image of what it must be like to sit in the palace of the Suyama heaven when the Buddha is there. These are uh, men who heard the sound of the Buddha and gave their lives to cultivating the Dharma. But as we look at the artist's rendition of these two individuals, we can think, wow, what must it be like when the Buddha is actually in the hall? Can you imagine? Um, could it be something like this? Here's the Buddha sitting on Zhu, Ye Mo Gong Dian, right? Resting, abiding at peace in the Suyama Heaven Palace. Now, of course, this is not. This is our, uh, our big outdoors Buddha here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm. But you kind of get the, the image, right? So I was happy to, to encounter the generosity of the National Gallery of Asian Art. And I'm gonna ask uh, Alan to share on YouTube uh, in the comments the website, which I'll show here. If you can, if you are able to do this, um, go out to this website. Here it is, National Museum of Asian Art. This is a current uh, exhibit. It's going to be up in, for, until July 24th, so we've only got a couple weeks to go. But they've got these five different areas. They have a musical, musical performances. They have Dharma teachers giving talks. We have, they have instructions on how ink paintings come into being. 
Then the object gallery is where I went to find um, all these wonderful objects, of which there are 55 a total. They include tea bowls, landscape paintings, bodhisattvas, um, arhats, more landscapes. This is the, the painting that we just looked at. Um, Bodhidharma paintings, fans with calligraphy and art on them. Wonderful things, page after page. And it's, it's uh, common, let's see, how do you say it? It is, they're free and you can just download them as you wish. And they are very high res. Here is um, Master Han Shan. It looks like this to begin, and then you start uh, enlarging it and enlarging it and enlarging it, and it's very high res. Look, Han Shan's the mad monk poet wearing his ratty old robe and his bare feet or straw sandals. There we go. Homemade straw sandals. Yeah, so you can just uh, share this. It's uh, open, what's the word? Uh, the, there's no royalties. So wonderful way to get people interested in Asian art and the, the art of Buddhism. All right. Hold on here. Bring up our text and share our screen. There we go. Next one. Shi Fa Pu Ti Yuan Pu Ji Shi Fang Jie Shi Gu Fo Wei Li they have all made the Bodhi resolve everywhere in ten directions worlds. That is why the Buddha's awe-inspiring strength pervades in ways inconceivable. Kundalini Pusa, I, I I want to point out that ordinarily every bodhisattva gets 10, 10 verses, 10 songs. He's got 12. Don't know why. He's, he's the leader of the group, but I, this, it's unusual that, that one bodhisattva's share of the praises is large, larger than the others. He's got 12 verses. They all, all the others have 10 only. Interesting. He says... The reason that the Buddhas can do these incredible things is because they made the Puti Yuan, he calls it here, the vow for Bodhi. Usually it's Puti Shin, the Bodhicitta, the thought of enlightenment, the thought for Bodhi. But here it's the Bodhi Resolve. Shin or Yuan, we're both translating as Bodhi Resolve. And they did that everywhere they appeared. That is why the Buddha's awe-inspiring strength um, gives us these amazing, inconceivable, meaning you can't think about it and it's hard to express. Uh, they say, you can't talk about it, you can't think about it. And yet, there it is in front of you. The Buddha is doing these things. Okay, what is the Bodhi Resolve? Just the briefest way to explain it. The traditional explanation is shang, cheng fo dao, xia hua zhong sheng. The Bodhi Resolve is a thought, it's a thought in your mind or my mind, that at some point during the day, you ask yourself, what am I doing here? What's going on? What am I doing? What, what am, and if I get an answer to that, the next question is, what can I do? What am I capable of? What is my potential? This is the, the original human potential movement, the Bodhi Resolve, and you take a good, solid, square look at your face and you say, 
Is this all there is? Or could I aspire to more? And it, it can be, it doesn't have to be harsh, it doesn't have to be critical. Some of us have this, uh, some of us have this, you know, internal critic who needs to be toned down. It's not that you have to ask yourself that sometimes we, we criticize ourselves so harshly that we, we block our, any progress that we could, we could make. But in any case, whether you need a kick in the butt or whether, you, whether we need to be a little kinder to ourselves, in any case, you ask yourself that question, what am I capable of? What is my potential? And the Bodhi Resolves answer is Buddhahood. Or let's change that into wisdom. Just say, you could be really wise. I could be really wise. Why do I want to be really wise? So that when a situation comes up, I know what to do. And I make fewer mistakes. Not only for myself, but in my family, in my circle. Situation comes up that's a mess, that's terrible, disastrous, and you know how to deal with it, how to cope with fewer regrets. That's my potential. That's Buddhahood. And it's called wisdom. You, you know, you know. And that's not only when things go south, when they go bad, but when things are good. You are there with your older brother and your older brother asks a deep question. And usually he doesn't share his deepest thoughts with you, but your older brother is just saying, you know, I really wonder sometimes whether, whether I, I set my standards too low. Maybe I, should, I, should have, I could still aim for something higher. And you know what to say. You say it in a way that doesn't trigger his need to, to be the, the da ge, the lao da. It, it, instead, he opens up his ordinarily very strong armor and has a vulnerable thought. Yeah, huh, I wonder what I, could I, do I, could I be a better person? Could I be kinder? And you say it, you know exactly what to say in a way that doesn't, as I say, trigger his older brother response and actually gives him something to think about. You know exactly what to say. Why? Fang bian zhi hui. You have expedient wisdom. That's your potential. Hmm. You're in a meeting. The neighborhood committee has come into your living room. The neighborhood committee is there. People who usually can't go five minutes without arguing. And you organize the program so that everybody feels supported and encouraged and connected. And when the meeting's over, you actually got something done. Why? Wisdom. That's why. So what is your potential? That's the question. That's the first half of the Bodhi result. And the second half is the way to get there is to hua zhong shang, xia hua zhong shang, they say. So it means immediately get to work teaching living beings. So my goodness, you should see me about 8.30 every morning on my deck. Um, it's cold and so the birds are out a little more, a little later these days. They're in the summer when it's, when the, the, the temperature is much more moderate, the birds are up early, but now in the winter it's like about 8.30. And here come the lorikeets. There's a couple turkeys that patrol first. And the turkeys walk by looking for something, anything to eat, and it's too early, I don't have anything out yet. So the lorikeets show up next. And often the king parrots, larger, beautiful red and green parrots show up at the same time the rainbow lorikeets do. And that's too bad because the lorikeets are bullies and the parrots are very yielding and shy. So having, in terms of xia hua zhong sheng, teaching living beings, I have to f figure out if I put food out that the parrots can eat, the lorikeets will descend and chase everybody away and then fight with themselves and grab them. Just like 
they're really, really warlike and aggressive. So, because I want to make sure that they get some food, but the parrots also get some food, so I have to feed the lorikeets their special lorikeet cereal first and get them up onto their feeder, and then quickly, and the parrots are watching, the parrots are on the side, and, and go over and put out some food in my hand, some sunflower seeds, and the, the king parrots hop over and gobble away. If I put the, the parrots, if I fed the parrots first, the lorikeets would grab it and they wouldn't get any food. So you have to feed the lorikeets first and then you can feed the parrots. And of course I'm reciting the Buddha's name with everybody. And then what comes next? Oh, here comes the Kurawangs. And the Kurawangs only have certain things that they like to eat. So I break up some crackers and put them on the railing and they eat crackers. And then after they eat the saltines, they go over to the water dish and because its crackers are dry, you know. But the turkeys also want to see what I'm feeding the kurawangs, and so they come up, and I have to chase the turkeys away because they're not supposed to eat the crackers. And then I go off down below, and I've learned that turkeys like to eat, picking up seed like, like that, so I shake a bunch of bird seed in a trail so they can walk along, and sometimes I'll get like nine turkeys eating on the ground. And if you watch carefully, the senior, the oldest male turkey gets to eat first and they have to wait. And if they don't wait, if the other birds don't wait for him, he will charge them because it's his job to take the first bite. And they all live by those rules. And so I'm there thinking, okay, so here's identifying the, the boss turkey and then his wives and his younger brothers and or his kids, it's hard to tell. And finding a way to make sure everybody gets something to eat according to their own rules of how it's done, according to their natures. And I'm hopping around. And then if a kookaburra arrives, kookaburras are carnivores. And so they want something, a meat substitute. So I have, Sam provides me with a veggie ham, so I chop up the veggie ham and wash it out. And I've learned, they've learned to play catch, so I toss it up in the air, and the kookaburras grab it. So it's Xiao Hua Zhongsheng, learning how to teach living beings. The goal is to give everybody something that they can eat so they can all hear the Buddha's name while I feed them. And it's, it's a trick to figure out who eats what and how much and when and in what order. And uh, then after everything is done, and everybody's gotten their fill and flown away, the pigeons come. And the pigeons, there are like five different flavors of pigeons. I had no idea Australia had so many different varieties of pig wild pigeons and doves and pigeons. And they come and they absorb everything that's left. All of the wheat kernels that the other birds turn up their beaks at, mm, we don't want that. The pigeons go and eat, happily eat everything but they have, want to have nothing to do with me at all. The pigeons are not domesticated. They don't want me, when I take one step on the porch, off they go. So I have to peek at them out through the windows. And uh, they don't, I don't get any chance to recite the Buddha's name for the pigeons, so. But every bird, from the biggest old turkeys to the little tiny feisty lorikeets, all have their different natures and their different habits. And interestingly, they're different rules. They're amid themselves, they have these very strict structures of how things are done. The lorikeets come in couples. Uh, when it's raining, they scrunch together. They, they cuddle in the rain and keep each other warm. And, and yet, there are two, we have a couple who are the local kind of residents. And when the food goes out in the morning, there's six or eight other flyby lorikeets who show up to grab the food. And then when they all go away, those, the original two are still there. They're kind of the hosts. So just to be able to watch and realize that teaching living beings must be just like this. Uh, can you imagine what it must be? Look from the Buddha's eyes when he's trying to figure out how to get us all to, to pick up a dharma and cultivate it long enough to transform Ah, 
and then we lose interest and he's got to feed us some other kind of food. So from the Buddha's point of view, we're all bird tribes learning how to, to get along. And <laughs> oh my goodness. So anyway, teaching living beings, xia hua zhong shan. And of course, when, it become, when you're talking about the Bodhi resolve, the living beings we're teaching actually are our own bad habits. It's our own um, blind spots that we don't see, that the Buddha is slowly, slowly trying to get us to let go of the thought that we have to have it just this way. Reality has to be just this way or I'm not happy, right? It's not true. That's just a, a way that I look at things. So the Buddha is always trying to teach us about, about our own xi qi mao bing. And around Master Hua, I was, people often ask, you know, what was it like to, have, to be next to, the, to, next to Shifu? Gosh, it must have been, I wish I'd been there to be close to Xuan Hua Shang and Xuan Gong Shang. It must have been so wonderful. And certainly, yeah, it was, no doubt, to have a, a good, wise advisor who's really trying to teach you individually is priceless. To have him be able to see your thoughts and teach you in a way that you can absorb. But, <laughs> did you hear about enlightenment next to the Chan master? Uh-uh. You know what you heard about? You heard about your own habits and faults a lot. Why? Because he was a sociopath who liked to pick people apart? No, not that because that is the quickest way to bodhi, to enlightenment. And Master Hua's vows, he's there to teach us whatever we can absorb. If he's praising us and teaching us to, to learn about enlightenment, it's just adding to the self. The darkness is thicker, the, the coverings are deeper. Instead, his job is to get us to remove the things that cover over our Buddha nature. So he talks about your attachments. He talks about your blind spots. And he's like a good doctor who says, you have to recognize that you're sick before you can get well. If you know you're sick, then we have a chance. We can prescribe some medicine. And of course, sick by sick, what we mean is we have a bad temper. So he's going to teach us a way to reduce our temper. Oh, we have a bad habit of low self-esteem. So he's got to encourage us to be a little more courageous. Ah, we have a bad habit of gossiping. He's got to show us that gossip doesn't help us at all. Oh, this person's got an attachment. He's got a sweet tooth. Oh, he's got to teach the person that there are five flavors, not just sweet, and they're all the same. So, but loving one is, is an attachment. So all these different habits that the teacher has to show us and then get us bit by bit to be willing to let go of. So around the teachers, you're, it's always like looking in a mirror and seeing your, your shortcomings. But at the same time, in the mirror, you see the perfection that waits once you can let go of those habits and faults. So that's what it was like. You hear xi qi mao bing habits and faults, much more than you hear, oh, kai wu mei oh, are you enlightened? Everybody get enlightened? Nah. What's that? Uh, don't be so greedy. One more. Got one more to go. Here we go. Yuan li shi so tan, ju zu wu bian de, gu huo shan tong li, zhong sheng mi bu jian. Far beyond worldly greed, full of boundless virtue, so they realize psychic powers, and all sentient beings can see them. That's the Buddha. No greed, not for our offerings, not for incense, not for praise. Full of boundless virtue. Wan de wei. That's the Buddha's uncovered his nature, so that virtue shines. And they have realized their own psychic powers, their shantong li, which they use to teach others. And all sentient beings can see the Buddha. Um, 
how do you see the Buddha? You see the Buddha by understanding your own potential. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there we go. That's... That's a message. Please share your screen. Thank you. Will do. That's uh, Forest of Merit and Virtue's 12 verses in praise in the Suyama Palace. We'll proceed next to uh, Forest of Wisdom, uh, Forest of Knowledge, some people would say. Hui Lin Pusa is coming up next. But. What have we got? Got something special for you. Praising the Buddha. Here we go. Okay, share my screen. Okay, you ready? Remember, we've been talking about the seven Tathagata's names, the virtue, the merit of reciting the Buddha's names. That's three. Now, last week we went through all the many wonderful things that occur when you recite these names. These are the names of seven Tathagatas. The first one is the Buddha Many Treasures. And the benefits of reciting his name we learned was that stinginess goes away. When you recite the name, Namo Dobao Rulai, you can leave the three miserable, three rebirths of misery you get rid of poverty. And practically, you recite for the success of shopkeepers. Maybe you, maybe your family has a, a business. Um, if you recite the name of Dobao Rulai often, the karma of stealing that creates poverty goes away. And so, says our commentator, business people ought to recite Namo Dobao Rulai a lot. Okay, so it's good to recite it together with the other six. So let's get in the habit. Namo do bao ru lai. Now I, th I think the Chinese is probably the best way to recite it. First of all, the, um, the, uh, the Chinese names are monosyllabic. Right, one syllable per per word. In in English, you have to go. Namo Tathagata, many treasures. <laughs> it's like what? How can I find a melody for that? So the Chinese has a real advantage, you know, of being uh, monosyllabic. So number two, Bao Sheng Rulai. Namo, of course, means I take refuge in. I return to. I find uh, my safe harbor in. The Buddha, whose name is Jewel Victory. What are the benefits of reciting the name of Bao Sheng? Animals. It has to do with animals. Do you have a pet in your home? Do you have goldfish? Do you have a gerbil? Do you have a uh, guinea pig? Do you have a pet rat? Do you have a snake? Do you have a dog or a cat? A bird. 
animals, when they hear the name of Bao Sheng Rulai, get protecting spirits. It says two of them on either side. And that keeps them safe from the miseries of being born as an animal. So our practical advice says when you go to the marketplace, when you walk through the grocery store with the butcher's counter, when you go by a mortuary, recite the name of Bao Sheng Rulai for those beings. Imagine being a cow. I was reading yesterday this story of a, a man who worked for years in a, a, a abattoir, right, a, a slaughterhouse, and he said he, he saw uh, something like 1,200 cows a day go through this big factory, and he said most of them had tears in their eyes. Most of them were trembling because they absolutely knew what was about to happen to them. Their end was coming. And these, you know, cows, cows are, they weigh half a ton. Cows are, you know, 1,600 pounds. And uh, their, their nervous system is just like ours. They love their children. They love the sunlight and good food and the nice green pasture. And <laughs> they go into this awful hellish place where they, all they can smell and sense and feel is death, they know. So the, the, the slaughterhouse worker said he saw, you know, tear tracks going down their faces. They were crying because they were terrified. So in a situation where we have animals in our lives, birds on the feeder or, you know, a pet in your home, recite the name of Bao Sheng Rulai and they hear it and feel better. So, Namo Bao Sheng Rulai. How could we do? Namo Tathagata Jewel Victory. Jewel Victory. Keep the Chinese going. Okay, next. Namo Miao Sheng Rulai. Some people will say, Namo Miao Si Sheng Rulai. Either way you pronounce it. It's Buddha with a marvelously formed body. You could say, beautiful body Buddha. Uh, the Buddha has 32 hallmarks. So who gets the benefits when you praise the Buddha's beautiful body? Ghosts do. When ghosts hear the name, Miao Si Shan Rulai, they change their yin energy to yang energy and if they hear it often, they can leave the path of ghosts. In the more practical realm, people gain a beautiful appearance. Here it is, this is what I promised, that if you regularly recite Namo Miao Sa Sun Rulai, you yourself get, he says, Piao Liang, you become pretty. Furthermore, for pregnant women, the baby in the womb, hearing the sound, Namo Miao Sa Shan Rulai, plants the seeds of coming out as a beautiful baby. Furthermore, you recite it a lot in life after life. Physical beauty is a part of you. You are harmonious to look at. Your features are balanced and everything in proportion and pleasing. So why not recite the name? Namo Miao Si Shen Rulai. Better than plastic surgery. It's as natural and totally in harmony with heaven and earth. So we say, Namo Miao Si Shen Rulai. Like that. Buddha with a marvelously formed body. Namo Guangbo Shen Rulai. The benefits of this are go to another kind of ghost, hungry ghosts, which is extensive body, guang, bo, shen, the body that is vast and proportional. Their throats expand and they can finally drink water. Oh my goodness. In the Shui Lu Kong Fa Hui, the water, land, and air, air soul mass, there's that portion that's called the uh, Fang Yen Ko, releasing the ghosts whose mouths are on fire. How awful that would be to Everything you taste, everything you put in your mouth is like coals and it burns your mouth. If we recite Namo Guangbo Shen Rulai, the throats of ghosts open 
and they can drink water, says our commentator. So we can be reborn in the heavens in a practical way with a large body, life after life. Amor. How about the next one? Namo li buwe rulai. Namo li buwe rulai. It is li, li behind, bu, fear, wei, terror, ru, lai, tatagata. So, li buwe, beyond all fears. Uh, I lost my tatagata. Need to be consistent here. Namo tatagata. There we go. Namo Tathagata. Okay, beyond all fear, fish and birds are ordinarily terrified by us. We're so big. We're, they can only run. They are prey. And so their only ability, protection, is to run. But if we recite Namo Li Buwe Rulai, they lose their fear. And they can also leave the path of animals. So the... Um, there's this, this wonderful ceremony in the Mahayana called Liberating Life, Fang Sheng. In the Liberating Life ceremony, we recite the name of the seven Tathagatas over and over again. This is a perfect dharma for people who have animals in their lives of, of some form or another. How about... Free from fear, beyond all fear. Namo Kanlu Wang Rulai. Namo Kanlu Wang Rulai. Namo Kanlu Wang Rulai. Here it is. Kanlu is ambrosia, sweet dew, literally. Wang is king, but I find that confusing, so we just call him Buddha Ambrosia. Ambrosia king, is that better? I don't know. I think we can just, that's good. So, sweet dew. The benefits of reciting the name of the Buddha, Tathagata, Sweet Dew, Ambrosia, fish, understand when you speak Dharma for them, for them. Or when you recite the Heart Sutra, Great Compassion Mantra, they can receive it. More practically, if you're not relating to fish, your own child hears the name Kanlu Wang Rulai, goes to school and remembers everything the teacher said. So it's very helpful when it comes time to take the exams. Mm. Imagine if I, boy, if I could recall <laughs> my algebra and trig and algebra and, and geometry, I completely blocked those classes and miss it today. So here we go. <laughs> How about last one? Namo Amito Rulai. Namo Amito Rulai. Namo Amito Rulai. Of course, is the Buddha Amitabha. Uh huh. That's our dear friend, the creator of the Pure Land world. People who recite the name of Amito Rulai, Amitabha, can eradicate 80 million eons of life and death debts. Debts that would kill us again because we owe a life to somebody. It's wiped away and we are reborn in the land of utmost happiness. Sound good? Yes, Tarva Master. Sounds good. Okay. So, should we pop up and try it again? Let's do it three times. Here we go. Namo
望如来。We're still working on a, a way to make this a more complete song form, but we're getting there. Uh, these are fun. I really enjoy. Uh, I started reciting the seven Tathagata's names on a daily basis, especially when I'm out with the animals around here, and uh, it felt really good. You know, this is nice talking to the fish and the birds and, and the ghosts. Mm. So, okay, why two? People become Buddhists. Ask myself that question. The, the, again, the source of this was I was uh, contemplating my lecture and thinking, um, why, why are you know, all the people listening? What are the reasons that they come to this lecture? And I jotted down my list and I want, to, uh, I want folks to look at this list and, and see if any of these correspond to you and if you can add some to my list. One, you were born into a Buddhist family. You saw your parents do it, so you do it too. Or could it be that maybe you had a relative who became a monk or a nun? Huh. We know that Jin Fosher has uh, knows his whole family, a couple generations now, who used to call him dad. Now they call him Dharma Master or Grandpa instead of Gong Gong. Now he's Fosher. Mm. How about that? Um, here in the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association, we have husbands and wives who both left home. Interesting. Yep. Uh, how about, could it be that your immigrant parents were Buddhists back in the native country, but when they came to, uh, okay, so I'm going to change the order here. Okay, I'm going to put, here's the way I'm going to change the order. Okay, first it was a relative's um, left home. But what if you had somebody in your family who was maybe the only Buddhist, but they practiced and they had this sound going in the house and it was a wooden fish. They were chanting and you may have, you know, growing up, teenage rebellion, you thought it was nonsense, you thought it was old-fashioned, you thought it was superstitious, but you heard it all the same. And you were aware when she stopped, and you were aware when she picked it up again, or he picked it up again the next day, and that was the door that led you to look into Buddhism more that sound. Uh, I've told this story before, but in 1969, I was a student at Donghai Dashi in Taiwan, in Taichung, and the, the group came from Oberlin College, and it was a nationwide, everybody, anybody could apply. So we had an all-American group of classmates at Donghai University. On the weekends, we did field trips. And one of the field trips took us out to Shitoshan. Shitoshan is out in uh, Miaoli County, um, where, not far from where Miaoli and Xinzhu meet. And it's a beautiful, tall chain of mountains with numerous Buddhist monasteries, um, all uh, in hiking distance. You can actually drive down from Taipei in the morning and get up on the mountain, but it's, it's pretty uh, vigorous. You have to be a good hiker to do the whole thing. Better to stay at night, overnight, in one of the temples that opens their dormitories for guests. That's what we did. And we spent the night, my very first visit to a Buddhist monastery ever, uh, or anything that wasn't Christian. And in the morning, at four, we, we had the hike was a vigorous hike, and so we, we all crashed on this 
tatami in the uh, in the the guest dormitory, and so we as soon as it went dark, we were asleep. So we were about eight o'clock. We were nine o'clock. We were already asleep, but four o'clock in the morning, dun, 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 this big deep sound of a a, mu, a a wooden fish, but this is a monastery wooden fish. So it's got this sound that just vibrates. And I remember getting up and putting on my tennis shoes and walking out of the dormitory and not knowing whether I was going to disturb anybody or what. But I went over and I peeked in the hall where the sound was. Here were the monks and nuns doing Zhao Ke. What were they reciting? They were reciting the Shurangama mantra. Lung in Joe, Namo Saran dos, Uchero, Yola, Rodis, Amel, Namburo, Janamo Saran do, Rodi, Rijani, Namo Zapo, Bodo, Bodiza. And that sound, as I was listening to it, started to come up through my feet. And it started to fill empty space, and empty space was no longer empty, it was full. The sound, had a dimension to it. The sound was like marble in the air and it was everywhere and every all of space was vibrating and I actually felt like my heart cracked open. That's all I can describe is there was suddenly something opened and I heard the sound of the mantra coming from inside me. And I absolutely know that this was a trigger that brought me closer to, to the Dharma was hearing the sound of the Sharangama mantra being recited. I had no idea what they were doing. What was that sound? What were they doing? But something inside me did. Something inside me knew it and recognized it. And it was like, okay. So this is autobiographical, huh? Reasons why one becomes a Buddhist. Um, your parents who immigrated to a new country, wherever you're listening to this, were Buddhists back in the old country but came over and became scientists or technological people and you picked it up later. Or this is autobiographical for, uh, for one of the monks on staff at the Mon Berkeley Monastery. The parents were scientists back at home. In this case, it was Taiwan. And they thought Buddhism was a bunch of superstitious nonsense. But when they got to America, somebody in their uh, Tai Da Xiao Yo Hui, somebody in their, tai, their Taiwan University alumni group in Southern California, introduced them to Master Shenhua. And suddenly they realized that Buddhism and science were best friends. And there, they were having difficulties that the Dharma could help with. And so they became Buddhist converts in America, in the new country, after having, wanting nothing to do with Buddhism back home. Huh. Maybe somebody recommended a Buddhist book to you. Mm. Maybe you read a book that mentioned Buddhism. For me, my earliest contact with any single word was Dharma in the title of Jack Kerouac's Dharma Bones. And when I got to college, everybody was reading Siddhartha. Herman Hesse, oh man, was it popular. But I want to tell you, don't read it again. It doesn't hold up. <laughs> once, once you understand the Dharma, when you go back and you read Hesse again, it's like such a disappointment because he gets the Dharma. It's, it's, it's weak tea, let me tell you. It's, it's cold tea. So anyway, but Hesse, Hesse has lots of other great stuff. But that was the first Siddhartha. We were able to say the name Siddhartha, which was the Buddha's personal name, the prince's name. So yeah, maybe that was what started you on the path. Maybe you took a world religions course in college. I remember hearing Professor Henry Rosemont. I was sitting in South Foundation Hall at Oakland University in a cornfield in, near Rochester, Michigan. And Professor Rosemont said, and the prince, sitting beneath the Bodhi tree, saw a bright star at midnight and enlightened to the way and became the Buddha, awakened. 
And as I heard those, that formula, Ye Du Min Xing Er Wu Dao, right? That formula, I had this tunnel vision. Everything around me went down into a, the single tunnel of bright light like a telescope and, and opened back up again. I was like, what was that? Right? So I was back into the linoleum floors and the fluorescent lighting and the plastic desk. And, but I, something had happened. And I went and talked to Professor Rosemont after that. And, and he said, yeah, many people have, you know, this is, this, this is mysterious stuff. So what else? Did you get to Buddhism after experiencing mysticism, astrology? We should add that. To get our typing right. Astrology, yoga, or martial arts. Martin Verhoeven, former Bhikshu Hung Chao, Susan Anderson, current Bhikshu Ni Hung Liang, both met Buddhism through the exhortations of their martial arts shifu. Master Jiang, Jiang Yinjung, said, you must know Buddhism is the highest, he said. Chan is the highest. And Professor Master Jiang knew what he was talking about. He had studied so many martial arts and painting and calligraphy and medicine and herb. And he said, you must know. He said, Chan is the highest. So maybe you traveled through Asia seeking to find yourself. How many of the Thai forest monks, including Ajahn Amaro, current abbot of Amravati, will tell you that they left Europe England, in his case, went to, to Thailand because it was what you did back then. You went out to, to discover what was, what was real in the world, how big was the world. And they found themselves in Wat Papong or Wat Bawoniwes or somewhere in Thailand and met the Dharma. And sure enough, it just opened and opened and opened. Are you someone who always wondered about the big questions and discovered that Buddhism allowed you to go look into big questions without having to buy the theology, right? Which is what happens with a lot of, of uh, monotheistic religions. If you don't affirm the, the causality that you have to, that Jesus died for your sins and washes you clean in the blood, you, you can't pick up any of the cosmology without accepting the, the causality. So in the Buddha Dharma, no, pick a piece of it. It's yours. It's, it's, it's public domain. This is, it's owns, nobody owns it, right? It's yours for, for, for the taking. When, when did you think your biggest thoughts as a child? Often for me, it was summer night, lying back in the grass, looking up at the stars, and just having somebody say, you know, they don't stop. The universe has no edge. It just keeps going. And they go, how could it be so big? How could it? And suddenly my problem seems so tiny, so minuscule in the face of something infinite. So Buddha Dharma lets you go there and don't apologize. Keep looking. The prince did precisely that. That's exactly why the prince slept over the wall of the palace because he suddenly realized that that he was going to die and just vanish. Going to get old, going to get sick, and going to die. And he needed to know more. The, his question was, can anybody do anything about birth and death and rebirth? Hmm. So, let's do one more, and then our time is up, and we'll, we'll continue the rest next week. Did you get to Buddhism through studying math? Study of physics, study of art, study of philosophy, or poetry, or Zen painting, or photography. How did you get, how did you become a Buddhist? Many people will tell you it was, uh, I've had mathematicians say, when I look at numbers, I see the face of God, you see. And when I see the face of God, I think of the Buddha. <laughs> so. Yeah, look at these reasons. Think about it. This week, maybe. We've only done half. What was it that brought you to wanting to know more about the Dharma?
All right. So, food for thought, huh? I hope so. Maybe uh, folks can type in to, uh, to the chat on YouTube or you can correspond with our, our translator staff and let us know what was it that brought you? Is, is my list missing something? I, I'm, I'm sure it will. We'll have the rest of them next week. Good indeed. Okay. We have uh, 115 folks on YouTube today. All right. So uh, I'm going to share now with you um, Maybe it was because you met a Shanjir shirt, like this one. Truly, woman the Yali. Okay, so I have invited an expert to describe to us uh, a method of dealing with stress, and here he is. He is uh, very skillful. Um, would you mind, Amitabha? Yeah, uh, yes, Amitabha. Would you mind sharing with us your methods of dealing with stress? Amitabha. Yeah, Amitabha. Okay. Ni kubo kui gan wo men jiang ni zhe ge chu li zhe ge ya li de fang fa. Amitabha. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Amitabha. So, how do you do it? Are, are, you look like an expert in understanding methods of stress and how to cope. And, and, and uh, so we're all waiting. You notice there's about 800 people here who would like to hear from you. You can speak Dharma. Amitofo, go away, Amitofo. Yeah, Amitofo, yeah. Anything else you'd like to share? Nam Omitofo. Nam Nam Omitofo. Nam Nam Omitofo. Nam Nam Omitofo. That's very profound. Um, and if we Nam Omitofo, will we have less stress? Omitofo. Omitofo. Um. I think I understand. Is that English? Amitabha Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, Amitabha Buddha. Very good. That, that's very helpful. I'm getting a little stressed out here trying to get an answer from you. Amitabha. Amitabha. Okay, Amitabha. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Amitabha. Go away. Amitabha. There we go. Wonderful. Well, that's a very Uh huh. Okay. As they say, what else can you show me, right? So, all right. Uh, I wanted to say welcome to join us next week to look into Wisdom Forest Bodhisattva, Forest of Merit and Virtue, uh, wisdom, Forest of Wisdom Bodhisattva, who's going to teach us uh, how he feels about being in the palace with the Buddha, how excited he gets and what comes to his mind. Um, the verses get better and better and better, more profound as we go. Uh, there, when we get down towards the end of the ten bodhisattvas, the verses are truly, truly memorable. And somehow this chapter never got published by Buddhist Text Translation Society, so we need to, to, to remedy that, get Shrufa's commentary in there. Uh, those of you who are used to joining the monks at the Berkeley Monastery online, you need to know that they are currently reciting the name of Guanyin Bodhisattva um, up in Buddha Root Farm. This is the, the week. week. Work week is over. They've done a lot of preparation and everybody will be arriving today and tomorrow and starting their reciting. They're doing it outdoors because of COVID, which is really courageous. And I guess they, it's, it's a pretty, pretty uh, ascetic up there, eating, bowing, chanting, all outdoors to keep people safe from getting infected by COVID. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. Go to the, there we are. Uh, hold on. 
Okay. Here is uh, Dharma Master Jinfo looking like Maitreya Bodhisattva here. He will be happy to recite the Buddha's name with you every day at 12.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific, is it daylight? Pacific daylight time in California. For us here in Australia, that's an early uh, 5.30 in the morning. In Asia, it's 3.30. Ha ho. But reliably, and he's got his, uh, notice he's got his his ground bell here, which he plays and, and makes everybody delighted as they recite the Buddha's name. Furthermore, the daily ceremonies are on tape. They're recorded. They're not fresh. They're not live because the monks are up in Oregon. But if you would like to join uh, any of the recorded Zalke in English or Chinese morning ceremony, or Sambui Bai, Three Steps One Bao, or uh, this is Jin Fosher's recitation, or Wan Ke, evening chanting, please do. Uh, it is here for you to join in. Okay, there you go. Uh, many people are doing summer break now uh, around, kind of around the Dharma realm, and uh, it's it's a good chance to practice yourself, figure out what, what you like to do and communicate that to the monks so that when, the, uh, when we get back to summer schedule, uh, oops, oh, oh, we forgot to transfer, have to transfer here. You can uh, uh, join with the monks and, and cultivate, you can take part in creating an online Buddhist community. All right. We need to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra and uh, send out the, the good vibes for... <coughs> excuse me, for people suffering uh, from COVID. I saw in New York Times this morning that... No, no, this was the uh, local news here in Australia that there are more people in hospital time during the COVID pandemic right now. Hospitals are full. And uh, yeah, so COVID has distinctly not gone away. If anything, it's worse than ever. So uh, use, use your best practices. And one of our best practices is Medicine Buddha's mantra, which we recite in order to uh, fill our hearts with light and to keep the virus at bay. You can do that for yourself and if you recite it regularly, you can do it for others as well. Here we go.
Jati Sam Actually, we can bow to the Buddha on the screen. There we are. One more time. Let's, first of all, bow to, hold on. We're getting there. Here we go. Respect to the Venerable Master. That will do it for us for today. See you all next week. Keep reciting the seven Tathagata's names. Omidoko. Bye, everybody.